Guild Wars 2 Secrets of the Obscure was our first taste of the new content release format that the developers have committed to going forward. Basically, instead of getting larger expansions spaced out by long periods of time, we'll be getting these smaller and cheaper expansions released much more frequently and in parts every few months instead of all at once. So we're living in a pretty cool time now where the next major content update is only ever a few months away, which is pretty cool. And if you still want to experience the whole expansion at once, you can still do that as well, just by simply waiting for it to all come out before buying the expansion. So how did this go? What features did they manage to pack into this smaller expansion model? And is it worth your hard earned money? I'm gonna cover all of the main features that you should know about and give my opinions to help you make a decision for yourself. All right, let's start with one of the main selling points of Secrets of the Obscure. I'm gonna be referring to it as Sodo from here on. The expanded weapon proficiencies. This lets you use any of the weapons that were previously locked to a specific elite specialization of your class on any elite specialization. So for example, the greatsword, which was previously locked to the Vindicator elite spec, can now be used on any Revenant elite spec. So you just get more options for weapons and builds. On top of this, each profession also gets access to a brand new weapon with brand new skills that it could previously never use before. So for Revenant, that is the Scepter, which is an extremely powerful support weapon. Some of these new weapons were certainly received better than others, but overall this is a great selling point of the expansion to consider. Many of these new weapons are now part of meta builds for a lot of classes. Soda gives you access to four new maps, the Wizard's Tower, Skywatch Archipelago, Amnitas, and Inner Naos. For me personally, the new maps were a little bit of a weaker point for this expansion. They're far from my least favorite maps, but they just feel a little bit lackluster compared to some of the other fantastic Guild Wars 2 maps. They felt a little bit smaller. Two of them have this floating islands concept, which is initially pretty cool, but the novelty wore off pretty soon. And because of this concept, it just kind of means that a large portion of the maps is just empty space, if you know what I mean. The main thing that I missed and felt that they were lacking was that sense of vast open worldness. A map that you can get lost in, that seems to never end and behind any corner you could stumble upon something new. I'm assuming this may have been caused by a lack of time and resources given the new expansion release format as well as perhaps just being inherently held back by the floating island concept. I don't think I'll be returning to these maps very often to just sort of chill out and be immersed in the world. It'll probably mostly just be if I need to in order to like grind some content or do a specific achievement or something like that. Speaking of grindable content, even though I wasn't the biggest fan of the maps themselves, the content that you can do in those maps is a bit of a different story. So one of the biggest features of Soto for many people is the addition of the legendary obsidian armor. This is a new path to acquire some legendary armor unlike any other set in the past as this set will be the first to be entirely obtainable completely solo and exclusively through open world content. And many of the new grindable types of content were added along with it. New meta events, map exploration and the slightly controversial Rift hunting. Some people weren't super happy with rift hunting. I personally love it. Uh, I went over rift hunting a lot in this video, so I won't go into too much detail here, but basically it's a pretty easy, low effort, infinitely repeatable and soloable farm that you can do at any time in the open world, which gives you a lot of items required to craft the legendary obsidian armor. So if you're like me and you enjoy a bit of that classic brain dead, repetitive MMO grind type of thing, then you'll probably like rift hunting. I also have a full video guide on exactly how to get some of this obsidian armor for yourself. So check out that in the description if you're interested. All right, let's talk about the story. No specific story spoilers here, but I'm obviously going to speak about how I felt about the story. So you can skip this if you want. 
So there's good and there's bad. Personally, as a whole, I think the story of Soto was one of its weaker aspects. It felt a little bit rushed, and there's a lot of new characters that get thrown at you very quickly, but most of them don't really feel like they get enough time to be properly fleshed out. And it just felt a little bit standard overall, with not many interesting or memorable moments. This was the first time we got an expansion story with one of the smaller expansions, so it seems like maybe they were a little bit too ambitious and tried to fit too much story in, which compromised the quality of the story. Since I've already completed all of the previous decade plus worth of story in this game, there were a lot of reoccurring characters that I had grown to love that were unfortunately absent from the story of Soto, and that was definitely on purpose. The story of Soto is kind of designed to be a bit of a fresh start that players that are brand new to the game can follow without needing to know all of this context of what has happened before this point. So that is definitely a big pro if you're a brand new player and don't want to start right from the beginning just yet. But for me, who has played through all of that previous story and has all that context, I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't include all of my favorite characters. Overall, I would give the story a 4 out of 10. I was definitely not impressed by it, and I don't think it's the best example of how incredible the story of Guild Wars 2 can be. Moving on to instanced content, we've got a couple of new strike missions, Cosmic Observatory and Temple of Phoebe, or Temple of Febe, however you want to pronounce it. And I feel like we've got a really wide variety of difficulties with these strikes. So the normal mode for these strikes are very accessible and easy. I'd say a pretty good place to start for people who are brand new to strikes. The challenge mode for Cosmic Observatory is a nice little step up in difficulty, but still nothing too crazy. And then we even got a brand new level of difficulty with the Temple of Phoebe legendary challenge mode, which is literally the hardest instanced content ever added to the game right now. So if you're a hardcore sweat starving for a big challenge, I'd say this legendary challenge mode alone makes this expansion worth it for you. People seem to really love this encounter. As for the design and the fun factor, um, for the normal mode strikes, I feel like it's not their best work, but definitely far from the worst strikes. They feel pretty standard. My favorite strikes personally are the end of dragon strikes, but the Soto ones are not very far behind. I'd say a solid 6 or 7 out of 10 for the new strikes. We also got a new type of instanced content called Convergences. They're basically larger scale strikes with up to 50 players instead of 10, and they can have both public and private instances similar to how Dragonstorm works. These Convergences primarily reward you with things that are needed for the legendary Obsidian Armor that we went over before, but if they are completed fast enough, they can also just be good gold per hour and they have some nice rare drops. They are pretty simple in design, basically just consisting of killing a bunch of trash mobs, a few champions, and then a big boss at the end. The challenge mode version of Convergences, I think, is where they really shine, um, especially with a solid group of players, maybe guildmates or some people that you know aren't going to leech. You get to choose which boss you want to fight in the challenge mode, and you have to actually pay attention and respect the mechanics, um, otherwise it's not a guaranteed win. Plus, you can get a little competitive. You get a leaderboard where you can compete with your friends and guildmates for the fastest clears, which is pretty fun. Even though I'm not the most competitive gamer, I at least enjoy trying to one-up my own previous best times. It's a pretty cool little feature to have on top. Another reason Soto is fantastic for newer players is what it did with the Skyscale mount. This mount is the closest to a true flying mount that we have in this game. It's a very useful endgame mount. Originally it was added with the Living World Season 4 and it involved a very long and complicated process in order to unlock. What Soto has done is introduce a second, much easier and more streamlined method of unlocking this really sought after mount. And a lot of the content in this expansion is based around the Skyscale. So even before you've properly unlocked it on your account, you're still able to temporarily use it basically whenever you want in the Soto maps. You'll just need to fully unlock it in order to upgrade it and use it in other non-Soto maps. So if you want to grab the Skyscale as soon as possible, this is definitely the expansion for you. 
It also added some small but very useful new flying related masteries that didn't seem super game changing at first but now I don't think I could live without them. Some of them require you to actually complete the old longer method of unlocking the sky scale in season 4. So if you haven't already done that, it'll be a lot of work just to unlock some of these. But if you're like me and already have that stuff done, these are some awesome new masteries. Sometimes you'll randomly get a little burst of bonus mount endurance after mounting up in, in midair, which is just like a free bond of vigor. You can make use of updrafts and ley lines without having to dismount and glide on them. And getting a bunch of bonus mount endurance after using one of them too is pretty handy. As well as one of my favorite, being able to mount up while in combat. It's only once every three minutes, but this is still pretty huge. Overall, I think it was definitely a success. It's pretty impressive how much they've managed to pack into this first smaller and cheaper expansion, and I would definitely recommend it to anyone who has been enjoying their experience with Guild Wars 2 so far, even the newer players. Usually, I would recommend the Heart of Thorns and Path of Fire expansion bundle as a first purchase for new players, but Secrets of the Obscure does enough for new players to be another great first expansion option. If you liked this video, you know what to do, and check out some of these other bangers on the left.